Today we're talking about prostate cancer that has metastasized to the bones. Now, while this is a serious situation, thanks to modern medicines and modern imaging, there are a lot of options. So today, Dr. Mark Schulz, who's a 30-year medical oncologist who's focused solely in prostate cancer, is going to talk about spot radiation and the different scenarios that it can be used in. So today, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about prostate cancer that has metastasized to the bones. Now, oftentimes in this situation, you know, patients are very concerned because it's not localized anymore, and now we may be seeing spots on a scan, and they're not, you know, when they're talking to their medical oncologists, I think it's a very scary situation, and they think, really, what are my cure rates? What is the possibility of me even going into remission if it's already hit the bones? And also, with the medical oncologists, you know, we're not always sure that they're being presented with all the options or the combination of the options. So I'm looking forward to our conversation today, but let's just start off with how prostate cancer metastasizes to the bones. And really, can you just explain the mechanism of how it happens and how the, you know, cancer attract is attracted to the bones? Well, this is still being studied. Uh, why? Why does prostate cancer have a preference for uh, lymph nodes and bones? Those are the two spots. In most cancers, the, uh, they're much more uh, profligate, and they'll show up in the liver, the brain. Prostate cancer is much more fastidious, and this is, a, I suppose, if it's going to spread, it's a good thing that it doesn't spread as widely as it does as other types of cancers tend to spread. Little cells break off from the primary tumor in the prostate uh, where the... Uh, the original tumor starts, and it float through the bloodstream, and then uh, land, put down roots, and then start to reproduce in these new areas. These are called metastases, and they actually can be tolerated quite a bit. The problem is, is that they tend to break off more spots and spread more spots, and then at a certain point, there are so many metastases that the bone marrow where they've landed starts to malfunction. Uh, so in the very end stages of bone metastasis that are uncontrolled and unresponsive to treatment, this is usually after many years, bone marrow, which makes red cells platelets, which help coagulation, and uh, white blood cells, which are your immune system, start to malfunction. And men with end stage prostate cancer that has uh, stopped responding to every treatment uh, typically manifest anemia. They may need blood transfusions. They may be more susceptible to infections and to bleeding because their platelet counts are very low. So this uh, is a defining aspect of the serious variants of prostate cancer that metastasize and then over a period of time become resistant to all of the available treatments that we have to throw at it. Just so I understand, I've also heard that prostate cancer can metastasize to the liver and the lungs, but what is the percentage rate that that would happen, likelihood? Well, the patients that I see who have known proven bone metastasis, I would estimate that far less than 5% have lung or liver metastasis. So it's, it happens, and we see a lot of patients, and so it's not impossible to have liver or lung metastasis, and we do deal with that occasionally, but it's not characteristic of prostate cancer that's metastasized to the bone. Before I get to my next question, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. When you do this, it tells the YouTube algorithm that this video was helpful for you, and it'll help push these videos out to people all around the world who are looking for answers when it comes to prostate cancer. Also, if you would like to join our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Schultz. So I've read online different articles where they talk about prostate cancer symptoms and they talk about you know, the possibility of pain from bone metastasis. Are there, are those true symptoms? Like what are the common symptoms that you would see from somebody who does have metastases in the bones? So in the early years when prostate cancer uh, more often was metastatic than localized, uh, the reputation of prostate cancer for having a painful bone metastasis was uh, probably pretty well deserved. We didn't have very good strategies for controlling pain back then. My experience now in this modern era where we're typically picking up bone metastasis at a much earlier stage is that they're almost always pain-free. Uh, there are rare exceptions to that rule. Uh, so painful bone metastasis are, are uh, men that have advanced progressive disease that, again, is no longer responding to treatment. It's a pre-terminal event when people start getting bone pain. Can someone have a one or two isolated bone metastasis that maybe someone neglected and they're they, they come in because the, op, uh, the emergency room because something is hurting. The emergency room doctor's very clever. He orders a PSA test and it's 600 and they've got a painful bone metastasis. Yes, 
But if someone's under ongoing supervision or has been initiated on effective therapy, that same individual had bone pain uh, and then gets started on effective treatment, the bone pain's gonna go away very quickly with effective treatment. Bone pain is a determinant in modern prostate cancer care under appropriate supervision is, is a rare exist, a rare phenomenon in my experience. And when you say the bone pain can go away relatively quickly with effective treatment, what is just a light overview of what that treatment would be if somebody does go into the Just about any effective treatment. So there's a long list of things. If, if people haven't had previous hormone therapy, that can be initiated. If they haven't had chemotherapy, if they ha there's different forms of injectable radiation, there's spot radiation. And I think maybe this is a good time to mention that because when you look at radiation treatment to the bones for prostate cancer, uh, historically, say 10, 15 years ago, it was almost exclusively used to control pain, and it was actually quite good. So I'm talking about the type of radiation therapy where you go in to a specialized facility and they beam invisible radiation, and this is used to treat pro the prostate gland, IMRT, SBRT, these types of beam radiation are common in the prostate cancer realm. But 10, 15 years ago, the, if you were to use that type of radiation outside the prostate, it was usually to control pain. Uh, so if someone had a, a spot in their bones that was hurting, they would go in and get uh, 10 shots of invisible radiation over, over a couple weeks, and the pain would go away on and practically everybody. So it's effective. That's quite distinctive from our modern thinking about how spot radiation works with men with oligometastatic disease. Oligo meaning they have a couple bone nets. In this modern era, the radiation therapists that are up to speed on the latest literature, they're not going to just give... 10 treatments to help the pain go away. Most of these men don't have pain. What we're trying to do is actually sterilize those metastatic lesions with modern beam radiation, with SBRT, IMRT. And the distinction is important because if, you, if you're being treated by a doctor who's thinking in the old paradigm, they're giving a much smaller dose. They're not really trying to cure that metastatic lesion. They're just trying to make sure you don't have pain. So it's a, a smaller dose. And that could actually be deleterious because by not sterilizing the cancer by just stunning it, so to speak, and making the pain go away, that lesion can come back in the same place, and then there's a limit to how much further radiation you can get. So it is important for pa patients that are getting spot radiation to their bones, especially if it's for pain, to talk to the doctors and say, are we giving enough radiation to truly sterilize the cancer at this location, or are we just giving a palliative dose to make sure I don't have more pain? I think in this modern era, we want to do the former, not the latter. So my understanding of oligometastatic disease is that it is less than five spots on the bones. Now, is there, how many spots is too much to do, you know, spot radiation? Well, spot radiation for pain, as we were talking about, is fine for, it doesn't matter how many spots. So if someone has 20 spots and only one is hurting, and if other options, so traditional options, hormone therapy, chemotherapy, don't seem to be plausible, then doing some spot radiation to that individual is perfectly fine. Beam radiation to treat spots in the bones is, really a pretty uneventful thing. The, it sounds like a big deal, radiation, and we are all a little concerned when we talk about radiating the prostate because of the repercussions on your sex life and your urinary function and whatnot. But almost always radiating spots in the bones is a fairly simple thing for radiation therapists, and it's very unlikely to have any side effects or repercussions that would be notable. If you go back 10 years, radiating spots that are on the spine, which is close to the spinal cord, has been a tricky thing because they didn't have the technology to shoot around the spinal cord. The spinal cord is the big nerve that controls the whole lower half, you know, from the neck down. And if it gets too much radiation, you can become a paraplegic. So that was an area that was limited in the past, but now with more precise radiation, the doctors can, can treat the bones in the spine and miss the spinal cord. Uh, with state-of-the-art radiation and, and implement this policy of zapping spots when it's appropriate without concerns about causing uh, damage to the uh, spinal cord. And I don't think we've talked about the issue of radiating uh, bones around the spinal cord in, in the context of how cancer, sometimes when it gets out of control, in the spine can start pushing on the spinal cord and cause spinal cord compression, which can re also result in paraplegia and loss of control of your, of your lower half of your body. So uh, men that have metastatic cancer and suddenly manifest sharp pain in the back or any weakness or loss of urinary control uh, need to go to the emergency room immediately. Don't wait for the next day because if 
the loss of blood flow to the spinal cord from the cancer pushing on it uh, isn't quickly reversed, then there's going to be uh, permanent repercussions. This is called spinal cord compression, and it's one of the few emergencies that we have in the uh, realm of prostate cancer. So when it comes to getting state-of-the-art radiation for any tumors that may be near the spinal cord, do you suggest that patients go to like a university or some place that is well practiced in this versus maybe just a local, um, you know, radiation clinic? I typically do refer to known centers of excellence for this sort of thing. Uh, and it probably probably is a prudent approach. I would suggest that if you're uh, referred to someone who just wants to just radiate a section of your your backbone and tells you that, the, well, the amount of dose that we can give is limited because of the cord. You know, they're basically just, in the old days, they would just radiate over the top of the spinal cord. And of course, you had to limit the dose of radiation, which would usually be suboptimal. If a doctor is proposing something like that, then I think it's time to look for a, a more sophisticated center, yes. How effective is beam radiation, considering in previous days, we've seen them treat one spot and another spot will show up. So it's not really putting a patient into remission, but what does that look like now? Well, I think this is one of the biggest revolutionary changes in the field of prostate cancer in the last 10 years. We've had very sophisticated radiation that can target within millimeter accuracy for over 10 years now. But we never really had a clear understanding of where the cancer was. And so uh, the difference being these new PSMA PET scans that are um, much more accurate and uh, much more specific. We've moved the, the, the warfare, which traditionally was at a more advanced stage because of our old fashioned scans, you needed a big chunk of cancer to see it on a CAT scan or an MRI or a, or a bone scan. And now we can see things that are down to you know, two to four millimeters across, which is leveraged toward uh, better uh, dealing with the disease at, at an earlier stage. Interestingly, in the old days with the crummy older scans, they were able to demonstrate value in radiating spots in men with so-called oligometastatic disease. All that literature showing that it can be useful to radiate oligometastatic disease was pre-PSMA literature. So yes, it is true that a good percentage of the men that embarked down a pathway of treating metastatic spots in that era would have more spots show up. And in retrospect, some of the individuals you'd question how much good did you actually do by radiating the spots initially. But other individuals, and you could never tell these people up front whether it was which pathway they would end up on. But other individuals I have seen go into complete remissions that have, that have lasted for years. Since the price of admission wasn't that bad, beam radiation is pretty easy to tolerate. I've been a big fan of treating oligometastatic disease with uh, beam radiation for many years, even preceding PSMA technology. Men are frequently going into durable long-term remissions when we detect earlier stage metastatic disease and treat it aggressively with beam radiation. So speaking of beam radiation in the terms of PSA, how does PSA act when you do have an oligometastatic patient and they are going in for beam radiation to those spots? When you radiate prostate cancer, people have this vision of this high energy heat beam going in and sterilizing the cancer and exploding it. And actually it's nothing of the sort. So when radiation is given uh, therapeutically, they don't give enough radiation to ex explode the tumor. What they do is they give enough radiation to poison the tumor. And the, these cancer cells uh, have their DNA all gummed up by the radiation, but they don't die until they try and have babies. And sometimes prostate cancer reproduces slowly, and you can see PSAs go down as the cancer cells are slowly dying off after radiation over a period of one to two years. So it does take patience sometimes to see how well the, the cancer is responding. And, uh, and there's also a phenomenon called a PSA flare, where within the first month or two right after administering radiation, if there's a, a burst of cancer cell death where PSA can go up for a little while before it starts to decline. So this phenomenon is being observed more frequently now that with um, historical beam radiation to metastatic sites, we would always give hormone therapy at the same time to try and handle the, the micrometastatic disease. Uh, but more and more, because we're catching it so much earlier, we're giving radiation therapy without any hormone treatment. And that is manifesting these kind of slow, languid declines at PSA after the 
radiation treatments administered. In talking to patients who have had this type of treatment, one of the issues that I've seen is mentally they have a hard time with like, well, my PSA is taking a long time to go down and I'm having to watch it for so long. So what is the monitoring process that you do in your clinic between PSA and imaging to help uh, monitor the process but also reassure the patient? Anytime you undergo any type of treatment, whether it's uh, beam radiation or hormone treatment or chemo, you are shooting to get what we call a complete remission, which is a PSA that dec ultimately declines down to less than 0.1. We know historically that those patients do tremendously better than the people that get partial remissions, where the PSA will go down for a while, but then almost inevitably the PSA will start coming up again. To your question about scans is, in addition to this wonderful PSA technology, which we've had for decades now, and which is incredibly useful for helping us decide when we can stop treatment and when we need to keep pushing. Because men that don't get their PSA less than 0.1 shouldn't be resting on their laurels. They should be looking for more treatment. The, the holy grail is to get a complete remission and get your PSA below 0.1. What we're finding when we do PSMA PET scans is that the vast majority of these PSMA PET scans are going back to normal as well if your PSA is less than 0.1. So the yield of uh, of cancer being detected on a PSMA PET scan in people with undetectable PSAs is pretty low. But it's interesting that it's not universal. There are patients who can have undetectable PSAs with positive scans. The logical question then is if uh, someone had 30 spots on their bones and go through chemotherapy, go through hormone treatment, their PSA goes down to less than 0.1, they're in a historical complete remission but then have a PET scan that shows one or two spots that are still hot. And have we turned this person into an oligometastatic patient that should have beam radiation to those two residual spots, even though they started with 20 spots previously? No one's got the answer to that, but it's a pretty easy answer because the uh, side effects of the radiation are you know, trivial. It's easy treatment to take and side effects should be very limited. So let's, let's gamble on the side of optimism and let's radiate anything that's still hot, after, even if the PSA is undetectable. When it comes to metastatic disease, your medical team is very important, and you want to make sure that you feel comfortable with your medical team. So please seek multiple opinions and make sure that you're advocating for yourself. And a lot of patients ask, what does advocating for myself mean? Well, it means asking the questions that you're curious about and getting the answers that you need. This is really important from a treatment planning perspective, but also from a mental health perspective. You want to feel that you know what's going to happen in the future should the cancer come back. And to make sure your medical team is not just focusing on your current situation, but also your future situation. A presentation I have found tremendously helpful for this is by Dr. Eugene Kwan of Mayo Clinic. At our previous conference, he gave us an incredible breakdown of the treatment plans, the side effects, the lifestyle issues, but also how to talk to your medical team and advocate for yourself through this process. So I will give you a link to that talk in the description below, and I would encourage you to watch it. Now, I know that prostate cancer, especially for metastases, is very serious, but I would encourage you that, you know, with modern technologies, especially when it comes to modern treatments and modern imaging, we still see remission rates very possible, and we've seen many, many patients in those situations go into durable remissions, as you heard, as you heard Dr. Schultz say. Now, I would encourage you to really build up your support team, whether that be your spouse, your caregivers, if it's your children, or maybe a friend, and make sure that you're building up the resources you have to take care of your emotional, mental health, and spiritual health. All, the, all of those things matter when it comes to quality of life. Now, support groups are a really great way to do that. And I know you may have heard me talk about the importance of support groups before, but I have found that metastatic patients who go into support groups not only maybe learn about a treatment they didn't know about, but maybe a way to handle side effects. They get the feeling of camaraderie and somebody being there alongside the journey, someone who understands. And oftentimes they build up lifetime friendships, which is really precious. And it's a great thing that we like to see here in the prostate cancer community. Now, if you need help with your particular case, you can contact our helpline at pcri.org forward slash helpline. These are prostate cancer patients who have been through treatment and they've been trained by our medical oncology team. They give you information, not advice. And their job is to help support you in building up your education so you walk into your doctor's visits empowered, ready to ask the right questions so that you can get the best outcomes. If you would like to contact them, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash helpline. Also, if you would like to join our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Our goal is to get videos out to people all around the world with information just like this. 
Now, I really want to remind you that you're important. Your quality of life matters. Your mental health matters. Your questions matter. They are very important. You are important to us, and I want you to remember that you're not alone. Please reach out and get the support that you need. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I hope you have a great week.